Hello, my name is Sarah Zedig, I'm 30 years old, and I just wrote 50,000 words of Homestuck fanfiction in a single week. Let's talk about that. Homestuck is a webcomic that ran from 2009 to 2016 for right around 8,000 pages. I won't try to explain what it's about in any kind of detail because it's one of the most absurdly complex and simultaneously simple narratives in all of literature. In short, it's a story about growing up on the internet and fighting against the boundaries of a coercive and controlling system. Something, something, capitalism is bad, you get it. Homestuck has a notoriously voracious fandom of seemingly perpetual teens. It's big and widespread enough that no matter what convention you go to, big or small, there will be people in gray body paint with horns and a zodiac sign on their t-shirt. It's the 11th most popular topic on Hugo award-winning fanfic site Archive of Our Own, and there are literally hundreds of fan adventures that range from side stories and alternate universes to completely original works that just borrow the format. But I actually don't have a lot of experience with the fandom, personally. I only read Homestuck for the first time from 2016 to 2017, which was basically a dead era for the fans. There was a long-promised spin-off game called Hive Swap, but there was really no indication that it was even in development anymore, which led a lot of people to assume that it was a doomed project. As for myself, there's a lot that I felt like I didn't quite understand about Homestuck when I finished it, but even still, it kind of changed my life. I mean, I think. It's hard to know how true that really is. I might just be projecting because I'm literally doing a video about it. What I can say for sure is that Homestuck legitimately expanded my understanding of relationships, and it introduced me to a lot of really interesting twists on the concept of self-actualization. It's also just a really gay story with lots of really well-written characters, and it definitely had more than nothing to do with me finally coming out as transgender in the summer of 2017. However, it turns out that I got in right around the same time that the Homestuck Hall finally began to whisper its profane invitations for the first time in years. This is my hall. It was made for me. Hive Swap Act 1 released in September of 2017 after five years of development. Viz Media announced their plans to publish hardcover books with author commentary. In April 2018, we saw the release of Hive Swap Friends Sim, a game I've talked about before on this channel as one of my favorites of 2018. This kicked up what I guess we're calling the Homestuck Renaissance. YouTuber Optimistic Duelist started their Homestuck Explained series, and Kate Mitchell started the Perfectly Generic podcast, both of which worked to popularize a conversation around Homestuck as a work of art to be taken seriously. I should mention that I'm now friends with both Optimistic Duelist and Kate, and I've guested on PGen a couple of times. So just keep in mind that when I'm giving them this free advertising, it's definitely a nepotistic exploitation of my social capital because I'm a con artist, and I am conning you. The ending of Homestuck was divisive, but I fall into the camp of people who were pretty satisfied with it. That said, I had some lingering questions that were rooted in a skepticism about the comic's happily ever after conclusion. I fall into a minority of the fandom in that I've always identified pretty strongly with the series protagonist John Egbert. On the surface, he's sort of a generic blank slate character, so it makes sense that he'd get less love than, say, the alien vampire whose lipstick is also a chainsaw. But I always felt like there was this deep existential dread underpinning his character, especially towards the end of the comic, and I wanted to explore that. So between March 30th and April 3rd, 2019, I wrote a 9,000 word fanfiction called God Feels, which explored those ideas through conversations with some of my favorite characters. And I really want to stress just how weird and out of the blue this was for me. God Feels was the first fiction I'd written since 2012. I've been trying for years to get started on any one of the handful of book ideas floating around in my head, but I was never able to push past this lingering sense of inadequacy. I was a writing student long before I was a film student. If you'd asked me at any point in my adolescence, since in early 20s what I wanted to be, I would have told you I wanted to be a novelist. So for me to have gone seven years without writing anything substantial, I kind of just figured that whatever drive I used to have was gone. So imagine my surprise when I sat down to play with a few questions I had about a webcomic I liked and wound up writing 9,000 words in five days. And it wasn't insubstantial stuff. A lot of its drama is based on my own depression and abandonment issues to such a degree that I cried while writing it. Which seems kind of silly, right? I mean, fanfic is just a frivolous indulgence, not a place for real emotions. 
I'm being facetious for the purpose of irony. I completely disagree with that sentiment. And then on April 13th, just over a week after I completed God Feels, the Homestuck epilogues dropped. They are a 200,000 word bifurcated narrative formatted as a fan fiction that explores questions of canonicity in the context of fandom, questions about who gets to tell a story and how their bias influences it, and questions about the rise of fascism and how people you grew up with can mature into really terrible people. There's also a proselytizing clown who's addicted to breast milk. So... The epilogues are controversial for reasons I won't get into, but I really like them, and they changed a lot about how I thought about Homestuck as a story, and how I thought about stories in general. And for all their provocative content, there's no denying that this sudden and gargantuan injection of new material really kicked the fandom's ass into overdrive. Anyway, now I'm going to tell you a story about a Toblerone. A notable fact about post-2018 Homestuck is that Andrew Hussey is no longer its sole author. The epilogues Hive Swap Friends Sam, Hive Swap Act 2, and Pester Quest are all largely written by a diverse group of other artists, with Hussey supervising and contributing to various degrees from project to project. This is a big deal because Hussey, for all his skill as a writer, is still a cishet white guy who started as something of an internet edgelord in the early 2000s. And you can see that legacy throughout the first third of Homestuck, where occasionally homophobic and also extremely ableist words and ideas get thrown around haphazardly. Some of this is debatably defensible in the sense that this is just how kids behaved on the internet in 2009. Like, I'm not gonna pretend that I didn't use slurs when I was 13. I did. All my friends did. We were a bunch of privileged gremlins who either didn't know any better or who were doing it because we thought it was funny. Part of what rings true about Homestuck for me personally is that the kids grow out of that language and do at times directly confront their biases, which is something I also had to do. There are a lot of instances where this defense really doesn't hold up and I think it's important to remember that. Hussey himself is very open to criticism and he genuinely seems to have grown as a person in the last 10 years. But the fact remains that the dude has a lot of blind spots, as do we all. So the addition of a lot of new people to the team was hugely important in reshaping how Homestuck interfaced with its audience. Specifically, the radical politics that had always been present in the comic became a whole hell of a lot more overt, which you can imagine has done quite a bit to help mature the conversation around Homestuck. Now, this has always been a fandom-facing comic, taking suggestions, acknowledging theories, playing with ships, that sort of thing. But it feels in a very real way, at least to me, that this interaction has grown to include a lot more thematic and personal elements. And I think this has a lot to do with the new talent. And by I think this has a lot to do with the new talent, I mean I know for a fact it does, because Hussey said as much in the introduction to the print version of the epilogues. By deploying it as mock fan fiction and including other authors, I'm making an overt gesture that is beginning to diminish my relevance as the sole authority on the direction this story takes, what should be regarded as canon, and even introducing some ambiguity into your understanding of what canon means as the torch is being passed into a realm governed by fan desires. The fan fiction format is effectively a call to action for another generation of creators to imagine different outcomes, to submit their own work within the universe, to extend what happens beyond the epilogues, or to pave over them with their own ideas. So now I'm looking to all of you on the matter of where to go next. Wherever the most conscientious and invested members of fandom want to drive this universe, as well as the standards by which we engage with media in general, that will be the direction I follow. Which at last gets us to the Toblerone. On August 8th, Andrew Hussey started an Instagram account called Eboy Hussey. <laughs> anyway, on his 40th birthday, he uh, hit a box of signed Toblerones in Toblerone Cave, California. Why did he do this? What was the point? I wish I could give you an easy answer, viewer, but I'm just the messenger. So okay, Toblerones in a cave, Hussey signed them. That's the first part of the story. The second part requires some context. Sometime after the epilogues, a headcanon emerged that asked, what if John Egbert is transgender? Headcanons, in case you don't know, are similar to fan theories in that they aren't strictly canonical, but may arguably be supported by the text. The difference in my experience is that a headcanon tends to be more mundane and emotional. Like, Sans Undertale as post-death Ness Earthbound is a theory, but Sans Undertale having raised baby Papyrus with a young Dr. Gaster is a headcanon. 
You'll see these pop up a lot on fandom specific Tumblrs and Reddits, very often in direct proportion with how much LGBT and POC representation the thing in question doesn't have. For instance, all the humans in Homestuck are explicitly a-racial, which is a nice gesture, but most people just kind of read the kids as white anyway. But even in the face of that, you still get a whole mountain of art and fanfiction reading Roxy is black, John is Asian, Jake is Arab, etc. Which is to say that where the comic doesn't provide, fans pick up the slack. Headcanons can have varying degrees of virality, but it's rare to see one spread so far and so fast as June Egbert. To me, it felt like June went from a few neat posts on Twitter to an almost unanimously accepted headcanon in just a couple of days. And honestly, I can see why. Like I said before, Egbert always had minimal interests in characterization compared to the rest of Homestuck's cast. That's an experience that a lot of trans people, myself included, can really identify with because growing up with dysphoria often has the result of distancing you from the things and people you thought you loved. As a trans person who always identified with Egbert, I think it's pretty obvious why I'm a fan of this headcanon. Well, Right at the zenith of June's adoption by the community is when Hussey hid the aforementioned Toblerones. The first person to find them tweeted a picture and had an exchange that ended with, Having proven myself both conscientious and invested, I declare June Egbert real. And then Andrew Hussey violated his long-standing social media blackout to say, You were the first to find my treasure and so it will be done. True to his word, Hussey followed the direction set by the conscientious and invested members of the community, snapped his fingers like Thanos if Thanos wasn't a Malthusian crackpot, and made June Egbert canon, all because of a magical Toblerone. This of course prompted a deluge of art and fiction about June, her trying on dresses and skirts, hanging out with the many ladies of Homestuck, generally being happy and having a good time. This stuff made me feel some pretty big emotions because I've actually felt a little bit like I've been backsliding in my transition lately. I don't have a lot of meat space friends, I'm self-employed, so I basically have no reason to leave my room, which means I don't have a lot of encouragement to improve my makeup skills or build a consistent ensemble. So yeah, seeing this character I've identified with for years get to feel the euphoria I've been kind of lacking was a big deal. But it also rang kind of false. I think June is a wish fulfillment character for trans people in the sense that the ease of her transition and the acceptance she receives from all these friends she's known for years is cathartic and nice to imagine in a world where that kind of thing rarely happens. It certainly didn't happen for me. And I kind of think it wouldn't happen for June either. Which is why I decided to write a sequel to God Feels about my own version of June Egbert. God, I jokingly started this video like an AA meeting, but we're 2,500 words in and I just got to the thing I wanted to talk about. Y'all. I started God Feels 2 Part 1 on September 3rd and finished Part 2 on September 12th, with a surprise not safe for work interlude happening on September 13th, all three of which totaled close to 51,000 words. We're gonna just shrug our shoulders and say that 10 days is a week and round down to 50,000 words because it just sounds better. If you disagree with my methodology, I don't know, go read a calculus textbook or something. Get off my ass. For the last week, with the exception of the one day I forced myself to go to a party, I did literally nothing besides write. I didn't work on videos, I didn't work on podcasts, I didn't live stream, I barely even tweeted. I was possessed. And this story isn't even done yet. I had to force myself to reach an appropriate narrative stopping point just so I could do any one of the things that actually pays my bills. But I wouldn't be making a video about all this if it were just like uh, a fun story. I'm not doing this to advertise my fan fiction, although please do go read it, it's very good. I'm doing this because it was actually kind of a transformative experience for me. And to elaborate on that, we're gonna talk a little bit about what actually happens in God Feels 2. I had every intention of writing another fluffy escapist fantasy, albeit one that had a bit more edge as June's friends gently push back against her new gender identity. But instead of this being John realizes she's trans and comes out as June, I imagined that John's gender identity literally split from her in adolescence and manifested itself in physical form, which is a thing that makes sense for Homestuck, I promise, and took the shape of Riska Circuit, a murderous spider girl who is notorious for having done nothing wrong and who once force femmed John early in the 
the comic. The big centerpiece of part one is the reunification of John with her Vriska gender, at which point the trademark second person narration of Homestuck switches to first person. Closeted trans people sometimes disassociate from themselves and view their lives as if they're happening to someone else, and coming out often has the surprising effect of making you feel embodied. So yeah, symbolically it made sense to me that June would take over her own narrative when she came out. Now I intended that to just be like a fun thing, like a fun thing that happens and then the story goes on, but Friska has a reputation for taking things over, and she did that for me too. And as I was writing, I quickly realized that my version of June didn't want to just be the female version of John, but rather kind of a whole new character synthesized from two very different people with two very different temperaments and levels of impulse control. So when June comes out to all her friends and they prove to be a bit more skeptical than she was hoping, June gets furious and causes a ruckus before storming out. After that, she gets drunk, takes some alien drugs, and uh does some shit to her friends. The rest of the fic deals with her desire to make up with those friends so things can go back to normal while also refusing to apologize because she knows she was in the right. Then misadventures happen, she gets the shit kicked out of her, she cries a lot, eventually she shaves her head into a mohawk and gets a tattoo. Also, yes, by the way, that is fan art that somebody drew of my version of June. I'm still, like, completely floored that that's a thing that happened. Please, 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 please draw more art of my beautiful punk rock disaster. I said before that June is a wish fulfillment fantasy for a lot of people, and the same is true for me. My version of June is a bitter, angry, impulsive person who has a powerful drive to leave a mark on the world that she isn't entirely sure what to do with yet. She doesn't take guff from anyone and basically never apologizes and like, God, I wish I could be that much of a bitch. Writing her has been this wonderful, vicarious thrill at the idea of just going ham on someone who mildly pissed me off. I went to pains to make sure that June isn't evil and to show that she's deeply conflicted with what she's doing. But at the same time, what does it say about me that I found her worst qualities more than a little aspirational? There's a moment in the later chapter where June is openly examining her violent impulses where she says, I think what I'm really trying to avoid thinking is that I wanted to do it because they deserved it. I don't mean in a literal sense they deserve to die for being kind of shitty to me one time. That's cartoonishly excessive. I just mean that here I am. Me. I am here. I'm telling my own story, and they're acting like it's an inconvenience. They're acting like I don't know what I'm talking about. And it makes me angry. It's disappointing. It's frustrating. And sometimes... Sometimes when you're frustrated, you just want to kill a motherfucker. That is a dangerous sentiment to just sort of put in a bit of writing that everyone can see. I immediately thought, wow, this could conceivably get me on a watch list. It's genuinely a bit alarming for this to be an empowerment fantasy for me. But in the same way that June has to be honest with herself and confront these feelings head on, I need to do the same. Trans women, in a general sense, have to put on a smiling veneer when we're in public, which is more or less true of everybody. But for trans people, there's a very particular threat lying beneath the surface of every public interaction in that a lot of folks have really regressive ideas about what trans people are and are perfectly happy reacting with violence if we cross some invisible border of civility. So we put on a patient face and shrug through the day as best we can and hope that we can get home before anyone else throws fuel on the garbage fire. And it's not like this is a huge imposition or anything. I'm pretty sure most of us just want to be nice most of the time. But sometimes, don't you just want to rip into somebody? Don't you wish you could just beat the snot out of the person who won't get off their phone in the movie theater, or who misgenders you when you order coffee, or who takes turns too slow in traffic? Please, say with a straight face that in this year of our Lord 2019, you have never once looked in the direction of the United States House of Congress and thought, boy howdy, I sure wish I could give them a piece of my mind. Now this feels like a dangerous thought for pretty obvious reasons. America has a gun problem. And we really want to believe that there's a fundamental difference between the people who go on killing sprees and the people who don't. But I don't think that there is. I don't think anyone is a good or a bad person. Good isn't a thing you are, it's a thing you do. 
your best friend can still screw up and do something that really hurts because we human beings are a mess. My point is, I think we all to varying degrees have these violent impulses, this primal desire to just go beast mode on someone who we think deserves it, but we don't because that would be a bad thing to do. Hurting people, it turns out, isn't good. Fun fact, unless they're Nazis. Don't tolerate intolerance. When we pretend that we don't have these impulses, that we're pure of heart in at least this one respect, all we're really doing is setting ourselves up for failure. Because regardless of whether or not these dumb and not so dumb daily frustrations are, cosmically speaking, fair, they still stack up. Like it wasn't that long ago I cried on the kitchen floor for 20 minutes because a cabinet door wouldn't open. Yes, that happened. But it wasn't just the door. It was a week of little frustrations that I'd been ignoring. All these things that were just piling up in the back of my head, souring my mood and priming me to throw a tantrum like a big baby when the feelings got too big for me to handle. We have violent impulses, just as we have sexual impulses. These are not good or bad, they are neutral. Functionally, they're nothing. They're thoughts, literally the most ephemeral thing there is. Now you can chastise yourself every time they pop up, feel guilty for how awful a person you are, do some kind of symbolic self-flagellation, try to forget it and then repeat the whole process again another day. Or you can look at this thought and really truly ask yourself, where is this coming from? Why am I thinking this? There's no reason to be afraid of these thoughts because they aren't actions. They don't exist in the world. No one is judging you for them. What they will judge you for is if it's the millionth time someone's pissed you off in a month and you lash out and do something stupid that gets you in trouble, all because you kept telling yourself, no, I'm fine, it doesn't matter, it's nothing, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm Fine. We have to be honest and look our worst thoughts straight in the eyes because they reveal true and often ugly things about us. We have to do this because we can't fix a problem if we pretend it doesn't exist. Writing this angry, impulsive, violent trans girl was cathartic for me because she's absolutely nothing like me. Except she is. Because I wrote her. She's got to be an expression of something real about myself. And that means that there is a part of me that must identify with her. A part of me that wants to be like her. Right after I came out as trans, a lot of my cisgender friends ghosted me and disappeared from my life. This is, unfortunately, a pretty common experience, which is why we trans girls tend to run in packs. It was a time when I desperately needed support from the people closest to me, and the fact is, they let me down. For a long time, I blamed this on myself, like I was asking too much of them. I kept saying, no, they're not transphobic. They're good allies. It's just extenuating circumstances. All while I was deeply depressed and borderline non-functioning as a human being. It took me a long while to realize that whether or not they had backwards ideas about trans people, they still did something shitty that hurt me tremendously. Because again, good isn't a thing you are, it's a thing you do. And when I finally internalized that it wasn't my fault, I got angry. So angry it hurt. And all I wanted to do was to go back in time and scream in their faces and push them around and break shit until they finally realized how much pain they caused me. And those thoughts scared me. Every time they bubbled up, I tried to tamp them down as fast as possible because I'm not a violent person. I can barely even stand realistic violence in movies anymore. This impulse isn't me, I'm a pacifist. What the hell am I even thinking? What I realized as I was writing this very thinly veiled version of myself acting out some of my own violent fantasies was that those thoughts were an expression of something. I didn't literally want to hurt my friends, I just wanted them to see me. And the fact that they seemed so dead set on remaining blind really pissed me off. My resentment at that entire situation might be greedy and simplified and certainly biased in my favor, but it's also a real thing that I feel. And through writing June, I finally laid out for myself the core of those thoughts and feelings. I wish I could be more assertive. I wish I wasn't so worried all the time about invading other people's space or wasting their time. I wish I wasn't so passive in the face of people treating me like shit. I wish I was brave enough to never apologize for being exactly who I am. Now these were desires that I had expressed before in words, but saying something isn't the same as doing something. 
But through June, I was able to synthesize those desires into a set of behaviors and actions that I could actually practice. Almost immediately after that realization, things started to change. I mentioned earlier that I went to a party in the middle of this writing process. And when I'm at parties, I tend to stick by myself and not engage much. But I kept thinking about my June every time I started to do that. And I could practically hear her telling me, no, to hell with that, go talk to people. And I did. I was social. Someone taught me a magic trick I don't remember. I flirted with somebody. Did you know you can just do that? Apparently you can just do that. So in a very real sense, this 50,000 word Homestuck fanfiction was both an outlet for my petty grievances and a focal point for the ways that I wished I could be. When I really looked at myself, I recognized there's a middle ground that June herself has to reach and that I want to reach, which is a place of being assertive and not apologizing for being a person with wants and needs without becoming unnecessarily mean about it. And I guess the reason I wanted to do this video at all is that the whole time writing this fanfic, going through this process of introspection, there was a voice in the back of my head kind of mocking me for writing fanfiction. Come on, Sarah, you're 30 years old. What are you doing? But the thing is, unironically, this is the best thing I've ever written. It's not quite finished yet, so who knows if it'll careen off the rails and into a ditch, but right now, I'm so immensely proud of it. I've poured so many of my own experiences into this thing, and I've gotten tons of comments from folks saying how much it surprised and moved them, how seen they felt by a story that was as honest with itself in the way that I wanted God feels to be. And even now as I'm talking about it, there's this big part of me that wants to apologize for writing fanfiction or to make fun of myself, do something to ironically distance myself from the fandom so the skeptics out there can say, well. At least she feels the appropriate amount of shame for her crimes. But I'm not doing that because I'm not ashamed of writing fanfiction. I'm not afraid to say that it's well written. And I honestly don't care if anyone watching this thinks I'm pretentious or full of myself for saying so. I got a number of messages and curious cats to the effect of, wow, you're so brave for posting your fanfiction on Maine. And there's a big part of me that just got furious about that sentiment. Like, what's brave about writing a thing and sharing it with people? Sorry I'm not cringing at my art. Oops, I'm being sincere about something. Now Reddit's gonna make fun of me. Oh no. 4,000 words of that 50,000 are one long, extraordinarily consensual sex scene between two trans women. I linked it on my Twitter, and I'm talking about it in a video to my 20,000 subscribers because I legitimately do not understand why we feel this cultural compulsion to pretend that we are not passionate about the things we are passionate about. I got my start writing fan fiction. I love fandom generally. I love cosplay. I love fan art. I love it all. And I've also written a lot of original fiction, including a whole ass novel. There are a lot of people out there who like to mock and belittle fanfic writers and artists as, I don't know, writing on the coattails of an existing property. Of course, a lot of those people are the same kinds of folks who petitioned HBO to redo the eighth season of Game of Thrones, so do with that what you will. But what fanfic does is allow you to step into an existing space and play with the toys that someone else has left for you. Original stuff requires world building and new characterization, and I don't know, man, sometimes you just want to jump straight to the good stuff that's the whole reason why you started writing the damn thing in the first place. And it's a good practice to do so. Writing is writing, no matter whether you can sell it or not. And in fact, quite a few people have gotten professional gigs from fan works. Everyone brought in to make new official Homestuck stuff were fans who've just been doing fanfic and art for a long time. Toby Fox did Homestuck music for years, used his fandom clout to fund Undertale, and now he's friends with Masahiro Sakurai, and Sans the Skellington is in Smash. A song that played while Vriska Circuit killed a man is in Smash! What I learned writing 50,000 words of Homestuck fanfiction in a week is that fanfic is just as legitimate an art form as any other, just as capable of philosophical introspection, just as personal and moving and funny as anything we might call original. Fanworks can change people's lives, allow them new avenues for exploring themselves and their identities, give them a model to practice on, to hone their craft, provide a safe place for experimentation and indulgence. You can't tell me that's a waste of time. Also, Dante's Inferno is just Bible fan fiction. Get off your high horses, you fu- Wow, thank you for watching this YouTube video. 
Uh, special thanks go to my $10 a month patrons. Stephen Johnson, Nick Hansen, Violet Viscara, Avery J, Catherine Crawl, Cochranel, Logan McQuiston, May Longworth, Emily Mays, Susie Maniki, Cynthia Darling, Austin McCauley, Radio Blur, Get Dunked On, Alex Laporte, Going Public, L Something Something, Faye, Mila Kwan, J Mac D, and the Barbell of Ziggy Burger is ugly. Quirk, Stephanie Johnston, Justin Cruck, Kill All Landlords, Amy Mims, Anne Marie Bernier, Not Sam, Bianca Gonzalez, Maddie V, Johnny Ansuo, Z, Robert Cutts, Rachel Ann, Gary Marshall, Scott Olson, Set, Zevak, Kyan Shepard, Cam Shaken, Marcus Kitzinger, Swisha Cube, Anarcho Duck, Jennifer Palmer, Nate Brogan, and Richard Daly. If you like this video and you want to see more like it, why not go to patreon.com slash LTAS and pledge some money per month. For a dollar, you get news feed and updates. Five dollars a month, you get access to notes and scripts and various unused materials like outtakes and stuff. There's also, everybody gets access to a 30 minute video essay that no one else in the universe gets to watch. $10 a month patrons get their names read out in the credits, and then $25 patrons get a letter from me. Sarah, hi, hello, that's, that's who I am. I also have a podcast, the Trans Questioning Podcast, which is on Lunar Light Studio Network, and you can find that where the podcasts are. Just, just search it. Just search for that. Just search for trans questioning and you'll find it. On the topic of Homestuck fanfiction, I'm actually going to do a podfic of the God Feels series or whatever, which is going to be like fully voice acted podcast quality uh, radio drama, I guess, of the, the, the story. And I'm putting together a fun little cast of individuals for that. And that'll be coming up soon, I guess. And uh, I, I think it'll be fun. I'm obviously going to be playing June and the narrator because I'm, I'm, it's my thing. I get to choose. You think, you think I'm not going to play Hamlet in my production of Hamlet? Go to hell. And also, of course, immediately after this video comes out, I'm going to be going right back to work on this friggin' fan fiction that has just eaten my brain. So um, there's a link to it in the description. And you can find it on Archive of Our Own. Just search God Feels and it'll come up. And I've been posting about it on Twitter, at HMS No Fun. So follow me there to stay up to date on my weird fandom excesses. And uh, yeah, that's that stuff. As always, links to stuff are in the description. And is that... Is that it? Oh, I do live streams on twitch.tv slash Zedek. Uh, okay, that should be that. That should be it. I think I'm done. I think I did the video. Cool. All right, good. Fantastic. I always end these like this, where I just trail off. What's up with that?